The Sri Lankan tragedy is a cautionary tale for the U.S. and other Western countries who are implementing the UN SDGs and building back better at warp speed. What is going on in Sri Lanka? Following complete economic and social collapse, the Sri Lankan president, Gotabaya Rajapaska, has fled the country. According to Al Jazeera News, Thousands of anti-government protesters have stormed into Sri Lanka Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe's office hours after he was named as acting president. Men and women breached military defenses and entered the Premier's office on Wednesday to raise national flags after police and troops failed to hold back crowds despite firing tear gas and water cannon. All of this is a continuation of the ongoing protests by citizens because of the catastrophic policies and corruption that have led to the total demise of Sri Lanka, who have defaulted on their debt, no longer able to afford basic necessities such as food, fuel, and medicine, leading to a humanitarian and economic crisis. Sri Lanka's annual inflation jumped to an all-time high of 54.6% in June of 2022, from 29.8% in the previous month. It was the highest inflation rate ever recorded, and the seventh consecutive double-digit growth in consumer prices amid a persistent shortage of food and fuel due to the country's depleted foreign exchange reserves. Citizens blame the government for the crisis, and rightly so. Lockdowns debilitated their tourism industry, a significant provider of foreign currency. Then, in 2021, the government imposed radical ideological bans on all synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, forcing all two million farmers to go organic. As devastating as the consequences of the pandemic have been to humanity, the world faces the even greater challenge of climate change in the decades to come. My government completely banned the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and weedicides earlier this year. Production and adoption of organic fertilizer, as well as investments into organic agriculture, are being incentivized. This resulted in massive yield decreases. And for a country long self-sufficient in rice production, this was a devastating move. According to foreign policy, domestic rice production fell 20% in just the first six months. And for the first time in history, they were forced to import $450 million worth of rice, even as domestic prices for this staple of the national diet surged by around 50%. <laughs> The ban also devastated the nation's tea crop, its primary export and source of foreign exchange. The roots of Sri Lanka's collapse span back to decades of indebtedness, misallocation of resources, massively expensive infrastructure projects that provided no return on investment, and in the past 20-something years, a government-turned-family business. The Sri Lankan government basically became an autocratic state run by the Rajapaskas and their kin. The embattled regime profoundly damaged their country with their cronyism, corruption, and financial plundering in their reckless attempt at implementing the radical United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, a global central planning experiment. The UN SDGs, which may be the 21st century equivalent to the Great Leap Forward, is meant to reduce humanity's footprint. It's worth noting that in June 2019, the UN signed an important agreement with the infamous World Economic Forum to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
Sri Lanka former Prime Minister and acting president Ranil Wickremesinghe is an active collaborator of the WEF. In a discussion with Aruni Shapiro, an author and blogger of Sri Lankan descent, she explained that the proposals put forth by political parties that are lined up to fill the vacuum are proponents of the same kind of central planning. Uh, they look to the West for ideas, and what ideas do they get from the West? Our war against nature includes a food system that generates one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. And the same food system is responsible for up to 80% of biodiversity loss. Yet, there is hope. Since my initial call for this summit, you have responded with energy, ideas and a willingness to forge new partnerships. At this pre-summit, we can define the scope of our collective ambition and strengthen our efforts to achieve the 17 SDGs by transforming our food systems. You only have to think back to the start of the UN over 75 years ago, when much of the world lay in ruins. At the very point when the world faced an impossible task, countries united and got to work. And although these starting points are very different, we need the same approach now. As Secretary-General Guterres wrote in the latest report on our common agenda, in our biggest shared test since the Second World War, humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, a breakdown or a breakthrough. The choice is ours to make, but we will not have this chance again. Western countries like the Netherlands are imposing similar restrictions to satisfy the UN goals. Dutch farmers, who sit as the second largest agricultural exporter in the world and largest meat exporter in Europe, have brought the Netherlands to a standstill, protesting against climate change regulations. The newly elected government has set up a 55 to 60 percent emissions goal by 2030. 70% by 2035 and 80% by 2040. To meet these arbitrary climate targets, they have created a self-inflicted disaster that will see the government drag its agricultural sector up the temple stairs, tear it to bits, and let whatever bloody stumps are left to tumble down the steps for the pleasure of the United Nations climate gods. Canada is likewise imposing this agenda. In December 2020, the Trudeau government unveiled their new climate plan with a focus on reducing nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer by 30% below 2020 levels by 2030. Building back better means getting support to the most vulnerable while maintaining our momentum on reaching the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the SDGs. Canada is here to listen, and to help. My Build Back Better framework will make historic investments in clean energy, the most significant investment to deal with the climate crisis that any advanced nation has made ever. We're going to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by well over a gigaton by 2030. In the U.S., prices of chemical fertilizers were already soaring before the Russian-Ukrainian war. Bloomberg states, since the war began, fertilizer shipments out of Russia have been severely disrupted, with some domestic producers intentionally holding back supply in response to Western sanctions, and many major shipping lines unwilling to touch the product, even if they could get it. The Food and Agriculture Organization warned in a report last month that food and feed prices could climb by as much as 22% in the 22-23 marketing season as a result of the conflict in Ukraine, increasing the risk of malnutrition and even famine. Samantha Power, the head of USAID, commenting on fertilizer shortages, which she blamed on Russia, said, Fertilizer shortages are real now because Russia is a big exporter of fertilizer. And even though fertilizer is not sanctioned, uh, less fertilizer is coming out of Russia. As a result, 
We're working with countries to think about natural solutions like manure and compost. And this may hasten transitions that would have been in the interest of farmers to make eventually anyway. So never let a crisis go to waste. I talked to some educated people, you know, meaning PhDs in Sri Lanka. And uh, they said, oh, this is very nice. The roads are quiet and uh, because there aren't any vehicles running, uh, lack of uh, gasoline. And they said, we walk everywhere now. It's good for our health. And we are not damaging our environment. And people will get, be in better health because they're walking everywhere now. So if uh, the educated people are saying that, how, you know, the rest of the people, how can they get any better? Um, how can they have any better ideas or they can, can, can they understand what's happening if, you know, if the so-called educated people are saying this? What you see here is what's really happening in a lot of places, which is where you have ideologies, and in particular woke ideologies, replacing prices and markets. You get these sort of classic misallocations of resources. So uh, it's what's so interesting is that these ideas come from woke Western liberals who are so painfully sensitive on questions of race. They did this to an entirely non-white country, completely destroyed the country. Will they ever admit that and learn something from it and stop doing it to the developing world or will they just move on like it never happened? I think we have a pretty good template for that in the way they treat socialism. Whenever it fails, they say, well, you know, it wasn't real socialism. I'm sure they're going to say this wasn't real ESG, this wasn't a real green policy, something like that. I mean, that's, that's, that's the playbook. The people's um, ideas when you see from uh, social media is that they say the two main parties, let's say the Republicans and the Democrats, have been running for so long, now we need to give to the Socialist Party a chance. And they don't understand that the, the two parties that have been running the country actually did run it according to the socialist uh, uh, policies. Violence robbed Sri Lanka of thousands of lives and decades of prosperity in the past half century. My government is committed to ensure in that such violence never takes place in Sri Lanka again. And now soldiers have been given the order to shoot anyone looting property or endangering lives. <laughs> the protesters defying a curfew are demanding the president, Gautabaya Rajapaksa, also resign. He's the brother of the prime minister and they're being blamed for leading the country into its worst economic crisis since independence in 1948. No education, no food, economy is at a standstill. It is my government's firm intention to build a prosperous, stable and secure future for all Sri Lankans, regardless of ethnicity, religion or gender. We are ready to engage with all domestic stakeholders and to obtain the support of our international partners and the United Nations in this process. <laughs> Our current food system is part of the problem. It contributes 30% of the greenhouse gases. If we are to achieve the sustainable development goals in the remaining time, our food systems must change. This is why I'm humbled and excited to serve as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the 2021 Food Systems Summit. My vision for the summit is that we must fast track and commit to ambitious ways of coming through on the SDGs. In this role, I'll be looking to bring global consensus on what future food systems must look like given the challenges. I'll be looking for agreement and alignment on the dramatic shifts that we know must happen. The prospects of what we can do together excites me. <laughs> The order came after eight people were killed in violent clashes on Monday. Supporters of the Prime Minister attacked anti-government protesters. More than 200 were injured, many had been beaten up. It shouldn't be happening in this country. Uh, yeah, uh, they, want, they want the blood, 
bloodshed again in this country. And people are suffering and the people are living with one meal per day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? On a myopic path to meet the centrally planned UN 2030 SDGs, in sync with many Western nations, they severely damaged their country. This disaster, of course, is not a reflection of a failure of the free market, but rather the result of a utopian global central planning experiment gone awry. At the expense of food and energy security, economic prosperity, and the liberty of citizens around the world. The Sri Lankan tragedy is a cautionary tale for the US and other Western countries who are implementing the UN SDGs and building back better at warp speed. Though our leaders appear hellbent on meeting these goals while sabotaging their energy sectors, food supplies, and economies, perhaps this tale will incite them to take a pause. This great central planning experiment is no different in its nature than those of the past and will inevitably fail. Collectivist utopias ultimately self-destructively collapse under a pile of their own delusions. Hopefully, we don't have to relive the horrors of the past to relearn this lesson from history. <laughs>